Kathy. And go. All right. It's now my pleasure to introduce building and sailing a 12-foot sailboat. We've got Jeff Coslow here who's going to be talking to us, so please welcome him to the tour camp stage. Thank you. Uh, so, indeed, my name is Jeff Coslow. Um, I am a software engineer by trade. About 10 to 15 years into writing code, I realized that I just really like building things, lots of things. And so... I started to do some woodworking, and I started to just do lots of projects on the side. Um, I didn't plan on saying this, but one of the, the, the reason that kind of made me get the boat was uh, I was all into electric cars when the Leaf first came out, right? I was, I was like, I got, I got to build myself an electric car. So I bought an Audi TT with the sole purpose of like ripping the engine out of it, mating on an electric engine to it, and welding up some battery boxes and putting everything together and building this. And then I realized that it was an $8,000 car, and I was about to dump 25 grand into it for a battery pile, about 15 grand on the battery pile, and 10 grand on the, uh, on the, on the electronics for it. And I just couldn't do that. I, I just could not do that. I just, as a throwaway thing, I just couldn't do it. So I ended up selling that car, and then I found myself going, I have no project. This is not me. I need a project. And I spotted this sailboat. So I fell in love with this, this little portly boat right here. You can actually see it down in uh, Otter Cove down here. It's, it's parked out there. I've been staying on it each night since, uh, let's see, Wednesday night. I've been staying on it each night. Um, the moorage here is not so great, so I'm, like, getting wet every time I walk out to my boat. Um, so this talk goes through... Uh, I've got, like, three or four different chapters. We'll see how much time I get towards the end. Um, First of all, we'll just talk about how I built the boat, and then I want to talk about epoxy construction techniques, because we're all builders and makers here, and so I want to talk about epoxy is something that you can learn, you can do it yourself. It's really amazing to watch a little honey syrup-like sort of thing turn into a plastic that's waterproof plastic, and it's really fun to work with. So, so uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the boat. Um, First of all, this, uh, the, the model name of the boat is called a Scamp. It's a Small Craft Advisor magazine. Small Craft Advisor magazine is, yes, a magazine, still alive in 20, 2018. Um, it, they're run out of Port Townsend by a guy named Josh. He's a, he's a great guy. Um, he went out looking and he said, all right, I have some design considerations. I want to make a, I want to build, sell some plans and have some CNC cut plywood that somebody can make into a boat but there's some requirements for it, right? Let's make this thing less than 12 feet long. That requirement comes from some lakes where like 11, 11 is, or 12 foot is like the highest boat you can make. Um, I'm not sure that actually makes a lot of sense because if that lake is that small, then you really may not need a sailboat in that lake, but whatever. Um, there's an eight foot, they wanted an eight foot sleeping, sleeping space on it. And so from right here up until this is a, what's called a cuddy cabin, from right here is about eight feet long. So I can, I can sleep. I sleep like a baby on my boat. Um, light and easy to build. Uh, th this one's kind of peculiar to this. There's a mast box here. It's about three feet tall. So you step the mast down into that. And that means the mast is, has about three feet of guide on either side. So it can't fall over too far. So you don't need wire stays. That complicates the rigging of the boat quite a bit. Uh, I guess I did say that. Uh, and then easy to sail. So these are the requirements. And Josh went out and he found this New, Zealand, New Zealander by the name of John Wellsford. Um, John Wellsford would fit in totally here. He, he claimed to me that he like, he, uh, he's probably like 65, maybe even 70 years old. Tough old coot. Um, he claimed that he like failed out of high school, couldn't figure out what to do with his life, became a diesel mechanic, and then some years later on into his life, he started drawing and designing boats. And now he's kind of a semi-world famous designer. He's designed uh, the Navigator, Pathfinder, and the Scamp, and a few other boats. Interesting fella. We got a picture of him later. Um, so Scamp number one was built in Port Townsend from his plans in 2011. Um, that, that is a picture, you know, I thought when I downloaded this that that was a picture of Scamp number one. It's not, actually, but that doesn't matter. Um, in 2014, I bought hull number 200, 284. Um, so that's the number that's printed on my sail out there. We uh, Traditionally, on your sailboat, you put your hull number on your sailboat, or on your sail, rather. That, that changes a little bit. Um, 
I figure there are probably less than 200 of these on the planet right now. So I've been a very small kind of club with these people. And just like a community builds here, a community builds around the scamp. We have a yearly uh, thing near Port Townsend where I get to go and spend a few more nights out of my boat in a couple of weeks. Um, the other thing that's interesting about this is this is built from 12 four by eight sheets of plywood. Uh, and it's surprisingly thin, uh, six millimeter plywood is a quarter inch, just slightly larger than a quarter inch. Quarter inch is 5.2 millimeters. Um, and then nine millimeter, which is very close to three eighths inch plywood. And that's really only on the sole, on the, bottom, on the very bottom of it. Um, and part of, the, part, of it, part of the reason why that can be so thin is the epoxy and the fiberglassing. And we'll get to that part later. Um, Oh, there's also something interesting there, which is the, the BS 1088, British Standard 1088, is a standard for voidless plywood. You're all a little bit smarter now. You know that the British have a standard by which they can build their plywood voidless. I, I just found that really interesting. Uh, so here's the, uh, if you're a CNC nerd, and I know there's a few of them out there, here's all the cut plans for all the 12 sheets that I have. Um, You'll notice, like, can you see this right here? You see some little kind of jiggly joints there. There's a few more here on some of these that are going to be the decks. Um, those are called finger joints, and I'm going to get back to those a little bit. It's just kind of an interesting little thing to try to fit together all these pieces. Um, so the design is a flat bottom boat. She's very wide at the beam. The beam is the measurement across the boat. She's very wide there. Um, She's got a pram bow, which I didn't really get a good picture here, but you saw that earlier. The, the front, the, the pram front. The reason why that pram front is on there, I get this question a lot. If you're going to take, it's hard for me to do this with my hands and a microphone, but if you're going to take wood and you're going to bring it all up to a point, then you're kind of torturing that plywood, which is what I'm doing down here right now, <laughs> but it, I'm, it's kind of at a lower level. And so... You're doing, if you're torture, if you're turning it this way and turning it this way, then you're going to have problems with it. So it's easier just to chop the front off and throw a piece of plywood on there. Um, it's built with an egg carton design. Uh, maybe we should call it like a, like a beer, beer container design, but it's, it's, it's where they slot together, you know, like the pieces of paper in your beer can slot together. Uh, the good news about that is that's very, very strong, right? They, it's hard for to move laterally. It's hard to move sideways. It's, it's hard to get any sort of shear on that. The bad news about that is when you're epoxying, you have to run what's called a fillet on each of those. And so that means a lot of epoxy and a lot of sanding. Uh, and we'll get to what a, a fillet is in a little while. Um, I, always, I already said that I had eight foot of sleeping space. So there's an offset centerboard. Would you think centerboard would be in the center, but it's not, it's off to the side. As far as I can tell, that makes no difference to the sailing of it. Um, very lightweight and trailerable. I, I've been told that they weigh about 450 pounds. Um, I don't have a scale that weighs 450 pounds, but I, you know, I, I believe that. Uh, there's a water ballast in the bottom, and I, we already kind of discovered the mass box. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about her, if you're a sailboat nerd, is on the left-hand side there is most of the sailboats that you ever see. This is commonly called the Bermuda rig or sometimes the Marconi rig. But it's, it's this mainsail right here, uh, which is very triangular, and it's attached to the mast, and the halyard hauls, the, hauls it up to the top. And then you've got a headsail, often called a jib or sometimes a genoa. And, and that kind of helps balance out and kind of gives you some steerage through the, through the water. Um, the balanced lug rig, oh, when you have this, you have, you, not only do you have adjustments for this sail right here, but you've got adjustments for this sail right here to bring it through the wind. Uh, there's also a disadvantage to that, which is if you, what's called jibe, where normally you turn, and if the wind is coming this way, you try to turn your bow into the wind. But if you don't do that and you turn back this way, then the wind comes whipping across, and what happens is this is called the boom right here. This boom will whip across from one side to the other. And if that smokes you in the head, you're either dead or in the water. And if you're in the water, you're probably dead. So that, those are, those are, you can raise them up high enough, but they can be very dangerous. Uh, so the balanced lug rig is it's balanced because it's got a little bit of offset here on the front of the boat. And, and uh, this is not a scamp diagram. This is just kind of a generic diagram. I think there's a little bit more space. Uh, the scamp has 100 square foot of sail space. And I think about 20 or 30 of it are in the front there. Um, so you don't have nearly the, the jibe effect. It can still happen, but you don't have nearly, it's not nearly as bad. Uh, OK, so now we're getting into the construction of this. Um, 
I wanted to show this, and it might be a little bit hard to see. Um, there's eight bulkheads starting right here. The bow is a bulkhead. There's one right here, and then there's one right here. And uh, you, I have doors in mind, so you can actually get into this front space. There's one right here, and they call this the cuddy cabin because you can sort of sit and just kind of hold yourself out of the weather there. And then there's one here that you can't see very well, and one in the back, and then the final one is the, the stern, the transom. Um, so I've got some animation here. Check this out. So that's the centerboard slot, right, on the, on the starboard side here. Um, yeah, on the starboard side, there's a centerboard slot. Um, and then I tried to mark, here's the two linears, like we talked about, that, that high-strength uh, eggshell, egg carton design. Those are running there. And then I didn't draw, I didn't mark in green all of them, but those are all the, the bulkheads running the opposite direction. Okay, now we start picture time. And so you're all victims now. I got your attention, and now you're going to have to sit through 600 pictures of slides. No, that's not true. I, I, I've only got about 10 or 15 slides here, and then we'll move on to the epoxy. So I, I just, I felt like this was a really interesting build to watch it turn from a pile of CNC cut plywood in here. This, by the way, this is called the building jig. It's, it's to give you a nice, give you the, the correct rocker on the, on the bottom hull. Um, so we had all these set up. And you can see this is my dad here. Did I say that? I, I went and I lived in Port Townsend for two weeks in 2014 uh, with my 18-year-old son and my 68-year-old dad at the time. It just so happens that I was right in the middle of age from him. Um, and we lived in Port Townsend for two weeks and just built the hull up. When I drove away, well, you'll see a picture of what the boat looked like when I drove out of Port Townsend. Um, so you can see the linear here coming in, and you can see these bulkheads. We break these down in a minute, I think. Uh, yeah, so here we are gluing, gluing everything down. The seat tops are on, but that, we're gluing it down with weights. Those are buckets of bricks or boxes of bricks. And now we've got the stern on, and we're starting to get some of the front, and we keep going with more of the bulkheads in the front there. And it starts to, but this one is interesting because we're starting to put the planks on. So this bottom plank is called the garboard plank, and then you just plank your way up up the sides. Here we're putting on the gunnels, which are just reinforcers for the, for the, the, along the sides of the boat. And this is just a shot. It's really clear that you can see the eggshell design in there, and you can see that there's a lot of strength uh, in, in putting this together. Okay, so there's what she looked like when I, when I towed her out of Port Towns. I'm kind of proud of that picture because I, not everybody gets to tow their boat to the back side of the uh, Center for Marine Wooden Boats there. And so I was able to take this picture, and then a year later, I was able to take a very similar picture. So you'll see that one in a little while. Uh, OK, so again, I said picture time. I actually went through a ton of pictures that I had, and I had to make some choices here. This picture is the centerboard. And there's two interesting things about this, only one of which you can see. The first one you can see is I've stacked some tile and two buckets full of water. A bucket full of water, a five-gallon bucket full of water weighs, what, about 40 pounds? Yeah. So I'm holding this down. I, I put epoxy in there. I glued it. You can see the clamps around the edge. This thing's not coming apart, right? The second interesting thing about this is that there's 22 pounds of lead in there. And I didn't even know this until I went to go build a boat, but you can just walk into a lead store and buy lead. They don't, they don't, I don't even remember how much it costs, but it wasn't very much. And they're like, and I, you know, I like walk in with gloves, and, and the guys are like looking at me, and I'm like, I want to buy some lead. And they're like, yeah. OK, come with us. And we went in the back room, and the guy lifted up a heavy sheet of lead and dropped it on a bandsaw, meow, chawed it off. And I got a half-inch sheet of lead weighing 24 pounds. I drove it home and, and essentially cemented or epoxied it into, into the centerboard. Um, just funny. Lead, leads are us, I guess, maybe. Um, the second interesting thing about the, this boat is that this is, since this is custom, um, I put in an electrical system. So this was a wiring diagram that I built up. If you're a real electrical engineer, then you could pick this apart, but it doesn't matter. I, I built this because I wanted to understand what it was that I was doing, and I'm not an electrical engineer by trade. So I put this together. Um, the end result is that messy wiring up there, that messy wiring right there. And this is the really interesting part. This is essentially a, uh, a cavitation mount trolling motor mounted upside down. It's got 55 pounds of thrust, and I can't equate that to a horsepower rating. I don't know what that would be, probably like a quarter to two-thirds of a horse or something. I don't know exactly. Um, but it propels the boat 
pretty much at whole speed when I turn it on at about a third of the third of the power of the motor. So I know uh, a couple of years later I actually installed a uh, a battery state of charge meter. Remember I was talking about electric cars. I know a little bit about this. Um, I installed a state of charge meter because I was always paranoid that I would turn on my motor and I would drive somewhere and then I would kill the motor out or I'd kill the battery out and then I would be stranded or stranded somewhere. Um, so a state of charge meter was a nice insurance thing. Uh, okay, there's, there's actually something interesting about the pictures on the left there. Anybody care to kind of look at those? Anybody here an electrical engineer or a, maybe an automotive engineer would probably notice this right away. All right, there's two buses here. There's a negative bus and a positive bus. Uh, it's a little bit easier to see here. This is a negative bus. And a, there's no ground. I can't ground to the boat, right? It's all wood. Yeah, I can't ground to the boat. So I have to actually have a bus that leads all the way back to the... To the and that's kind of why I made that wiring diagram, because I couldn't just do it the one way I had to do. Yeah. Uh, okay, the other interesting thing is that I had to flip it over. So I had this thing in my garage. I had to flip it over so that I could do the fiberglassing. And this is, we'll talk a little bit about fiberglassing later. This is a shot of the fiberglass. That's a shot of me half, half flipped over. And then this is a shot when I was all done. Uh, I had to build these skegs. I actually burned out a jigsaw trying to build these skegs out of uh, red oak, which is quite hard. Um, the other interesting thing about it is that it's black. And the reason why I did that, we'll talk about epoxy additives. It's black because I added graphite powder, the same stuff you use to lubricate a lock when, you, when, you, uh, when you're about to go pick it. Or, well, I, we all know what sort of conference this is. Maybe if you're just like, your key is broken in the lock or something and you need to get it out. Um, that's, that's graphite powder. And the graphite powder adds a lot of... Uh, a lot of abrasion resistance, right? It's kind of like carbon fiber in a way, but it's not, it's, it's a poor man's version of carbon fiber. Um, but it does add some abrasion resistance, and that's a good thing for the bottom of a boat to have. Uh, here she is on the trailer. Um, you can see the black quite well. This is before I started doing all the finishing work. I like this one, and the reason, again, I'm not trying to talk you through 600 pictures here, but I like this one because you can see where I was sanding it down. Right? It's no longer that shiny black, so I had to sand it down before I painted it, and that's kind of what that results in. Uh, that's me painting on the boot stripe. There, now she's red, and here I rigged her in my garage, or rigged her in my front yard one sunny day in late May of, let's see, that would have been 2015. I had no idea what I was doing. I had never rigged a sailboat like this before. It took me forever, but when I finally got it, I was like, I'm an engineer, right? So I'm like, okay, I did that once. Let me do it again the second time, exactly the same way. All right, that works, right? And then I went out and put it on the water, and I've learned some since then, but that's the point is, yeah. Uh, okay, the other, other interesting thing, and this is the last one, is that summer I knew I was going to spend at least a few nights on her, and so I built myself a tent, and I was terrible. I didn't know anything about sewing. I hadn't sewed in years. So I left a lot of these ragged edges and and... It, it looked bad, and I've, I've got, I redid that then. Uh, so I redid it just this spring. I dragged out a sewing machine, and I made some nice, cu nice tight cuts around here, and I installed little button snaps all over the boat so that I can sleep under that. And, and uh, again, sleeping on it is really nice. I actually made two of these tents. One of them I made out of just duck cotton or duck canvas like this. The second one I made out of an old tarp. <laughs> because I was like paranoid that this would leak. You have to be very taut. The idea behind a duck canvas is that the, the cotton will swell, and then once the water hits it, it will just run right off. But that means you have it really taut and tight, and I don't really have this all that tight. So, so that's the last of my pictures, I think. Oh, there you go, the bonus of, of, of me taking it in, on, on the Center for Wooden Boats in Port Townsend a year later. Okay. So this might be more interesting to a few more people, is how to work with epoxy. I find epoxy fascinating to work with. Like I said earlier, you mix together a couple of liquid. Oh, most people think of epoxy, they think of the five minute kind that comes in the syringes. You sort of stir it up and then you jam it onto something and hopefully it'll stick forever and it doesn't and it breaks at some inopportune time. Um, when, a, when a boat builder thinks about epoxy, this is what they usually think of. There's a lot of brand names and they all compete against each other. Um, don't, I'm not endorsing these guys. They're pretty good. They're, they're actually interesting. But uh, So the important bit that you need to know here, um, we already talked about this. It hardens to a plastic in four to six hours. It's a resin and a hardener. 
Um, the ratios are usually by volume, somewhere around one to two. Um, the stuff that I use is one to four volume on that. So usually the way you do this is you, you have little hand pumps that go in the jar, and they actually showed that. There, they showed the little hand pumps there. Um, it's really important because if you mix it up and you say one, two, oh shit, I forgot. I need, do I need one pump or two pumps of the hardener? So you alternate, just, just little techniques, right? The, it, epoxy guys really do this, really work with this a lot. The other really, really interesting thing about, about epoxy is that it's exothermic. So as it's curing, it's putting out heat. However, it also cures with heat, right? This is not an oxygen thing, it's not a glue, it's not a, a water in the atmosphere or anything. There's a lot of ways that glues work, but this is purely a chemical reaction. It gives off heat and it cures faster with heat. So there's one really interesting thing. My son did this. He did like four pumps, right? One, two, three, four pumps. Actually, one, one, two, two, three. And as we were, and he had to wait for a little while. And he started, all of a sudden, he kind of started going like this. And I was like, what's going on? And I, I grabbed the bag from him. A lot of times what you do is you put, uh, you mix it up, because you mix it up with uh, additives to make it thicker or harder or whatever. Um, and I sort of squished it a little bit, and I could feel a hard ball in the center. This is the concept of, uh, what do they say, nuclear bombs, like a critical mass, right? It hit a critical mass, and the heat, because heat radiates in 360 degrees, so where's the hottest point exactly? At the center, that part cured into a hard little ball, and it started spreading out even further. And so he, he eventually had to take that, that mix and set it outside and just let it cool outside, and, and it boiled over a little bit, and it made a huge mess. Um, but but I, I find that really fascinating, right? It's like it cures by its own heat, so you have to be, work with it really carefully. And if it's a hot day, then you only have, you know, maybe 20 minutes of shelf time, if even that. Uh, as a matter of fact, you'll notice that on this page right here, oh, you can't read that. It, it says fast hardener. A lot of times they have fast and slow, or maybe fast, medium, and slow hardeners to mix with these. Uh, quite often, whoops. Quite often it is used with fiberglass, which I was astounded to read really truly is glass fiber that they spin because it's very flexible. I have some down by, by the little boat project if you want to come down and take a look at it. Uh, Kevlar, Kevlar has an interesting properties of being able to spread out when a force hits it, it kind of spreads out, which makes it a nice bulletproof thing. Or carbon fiber, which is not good for bulletproof stuff. It is, however, good for abrasion resistance. It, it, will, it will just deflect the energy to the side. Um, well, actually, that kind of sounds like the same thing, doesn't it? Um, but that's that. So we've been through some of these, I guess. Uh, the good and bad properties of an epoxy, they're flexible. Um, it can crack under stress if you have a lot of it really, really thick. Um, it, can, it can be a little bit brittle. Uh, it's, it's very easy to work, although you do have limited shelf time, limited mix time, limited time with it. But when you get it, it's, you can work with it. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, VOC, volatile organic compounds, that come out of it, uh, but it's not toxic. The first time I tried to work with it, I was like prepared to put on a respirator. You do need a respirator, but not for that part. You, what you need the respirator for is sanding, because if you're sanding anything down, if you make runs or drips or anything like that, you really, really don't want that plastic in your lungs, especially if you've added additives to it. Uh, I guess we say that over here. Uh, additives make it really versatile. We'll go through some of those additives. Um, oftentimes it's stronger than wood, so a lot of people say that when you make the bond, you know, the wood on either side is going to crack before the epoxy does. Um, one thing that's never happened to me is skin allergies. Once you developed a skin allergy to some of this epoxy resin, you, there, you just can't work with it anymore. Um, you don't want the sanding dust in your lungs. Uh, sanding is really common and really boring. I mentioned those fillets earlier. You can spend a lot of time doing that. My wife was very angry with me for having a, even having a tent in my garage where I kept the boat with all the sand, sanding dust that came out of it. Um, and then finally, it's, it's rather expensive-ish. Um, certainly expensive enough that if you're building a boat with it that you don't want to sink, that you want to invest some money in it. But it's, it's, a, it's a tad on the expensive side. Uh, versatile. So we were talking about this. First of all, just if you coat wood with it, so plastic, so it's a waterproof coating, make sure you do it a couple, three times to make sure you get all through there. It can be used like a very, very strong glue. Uh, the usual additive for this is a silica dust, um, and that makes it very strong. It's, however, does add some brittleness to it, but it's a good, strong glue. Uh, we already talked a little bit about the fillets. I have got a diagram for that. Um, 
so let's think about this fillet, filler to hold fasteners, but not too brittle. So if you have a really brittle, like think about wood. You put a screw into wood, and it sort of holds that screw in there, and you can't pull it back out. But if wood were more brittle, you could just pull it out, and then you've got a screw hole that you can't do anything else with, right? So, so there's some additives. Actually, wood flour is a great additive, just sawdust, really, really fine sawdust. You add that, and now you've got a very powerful or a very good substance that you can drive a screw into. Um, Kevlar, carbon fiber. Um, the brothers who invented that West system got into wind vanes, the big ones that you see out in the prairies. Um, they got into building those for a while. Uh, and so uh, most of those are now built with e the epoxy over carbon fiber. Um, and then chemically wise, I find this one fascinating. The epoxy is hard within about four to six hours, but it's still chemically active for something on the order of 72 hours. So if you need to add a second coat on top of it, add it within 72 hours, and it'll just chemically bond to the other one because it's terrible if epoxy delaminates, right? You've got two layers and it just pops off because it didn't have enough chemical bite to the other one. Uh, you can sand that and you can get it to stick, but it's better just to, to do it within 72 hours. Uh, we talked about the mixing of the, of the resin, and I guess I kind of went through these. Uh, let's see, chopped glass fiber, strong, terrible to sand, uh, glass dust, like literally glass dust you can add in there. Um, never bothered to do that. Uh, micro balloons, these little little teeny balloons that have just a little teeny air pocket in them, so it expands the volume without adding a whole lot of, uh, just expands the volume, and that makes it really easy to sand also. Uh, some fairing mixture. Fairing is the process of taking a surface and making it nice and smooth, and so that's a sanding thing as well. Um, graphite, we already talked a little bit about the graphite. Uh, silica powder, I've got that some down below. Um, strong, brittle glue. Uh, we talked a little bit about this. The open time is how much time you have. And again, I find this really fascinating. When we first started with, working with epoxy, the guys were like, oh, you got open time, you got set. It goes off is that phenomena where the, you know, the center just gets too hot and all of a sudden it starts getting firming up. Uh, green epoxy is, is not quite cured and very flexible. You can cut it with a knife if you want to. Uh, and then they have the whole vocabulary about consistency. Mix me up some peanut butter, or mix me up some, some honey, or mix me up something, and everybody will know what you're talking about. Okay, so th I find this also really interesting. So this is, just think of this like in a, in a plank, right? So a plank you're gonna put on the side of the boat. Your CNC, your four by CNC machine can't cut you a 12 foot piece of, piece of wood. You just can't do that. So how are you going to join together two pieces of wood to make a 12-foot plank from a 4-foot-8 plywood sheet? Well, you could butt it together, right? You could pay, take your epoxy right here, mix up some with some glue additive, shove it together, and then put fiberglass on the top and the bottom. It seems like a decently strong, decently strong thing. And it is, but there's not a lot of glue in there. And so some people started to use scarf joints. And scarf joints are easy. You stack these on top of each other, and you take a plane, and you plane them down on the side. And then you've got the same angle, and you can turn one over and put them together. You've got a lot of glue in there, so it's a nice, strong bond. Um, you put the fiberglass on top of it. It's probably not going to break, but it's a, lo it's a lot of work. And so I, I specifically wanted to call out, I mentioned those puzzle joints earlier. And I should have zoomed in on this just a little bit, but you can see a puzzle joint right here, and it's these fingers. I, I can't do it with my fingers, but they sort of interlock like that. And now you've, you've, it's, you've eliminated, if you, talk, if you think about the surface area that's in that, you've eliminated the, the lack of surface area, right? You've got this curve that's all there, and it's fit together. I think this, I think this is an area where CNC guys like totally made this, because nobody before CNC machines would have cut these finger joints Nobody would have done that. But it's totally plausible with a, with a CNC machine. Uh, and so nobody hardly uses scarf joints anymore in woodworking. See the puzzle joints? OK. So I have a little demo boat build that I'm doing right down by the maker tent down there. Stop by and watch me for a little while. Um, what happens if you have to make a butt joint at an angle? Um, so what I'm doing down there is I'm using a technique called stitch and glue. So I drilled some holes, and I put some wires through the holes, and then I twist them off down here. And that binds it together real well. It's kind of loose in this picture, but the, it binds them together very well. And then what I do is I push those wires down as far as I can to kind of push them in there. 
uh, and then I, I build a fillet over the top of that. And this is what I talked about earlier. The fillet goes all the way here. So you've got a lot of bonding strength on that wood right there. You've got a lot of bonding strength over here. It's very hard to shear it this way. It's very hard to shear it that way. It's very hard to bend it this way because you've got all this right there. Makes sense. Uh, let's see. And then you go ahead and you, you fill that in with, I've just got some syringes down there. So you just go ahead and fill in that little gap there. Um, by the way, that takes a lot of sanding and smoothing over and things like that. And then finally, you go ahead and lay your, lay your sheet of uh, 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 fiberglass tape over that. And you run that all along the whole joint. And now you've got a very, very strong joint that's probably not going to crack on that. Again, you're probably going to crack the wood or you're going you're gonna to break something else. Um, OK, we're coming to the end of this. So if you ever work with epoxy, I already mentioned count your measured pumps. Uh, work quickly or your batch will go off on you. Uh, work cleanly. Um, if you get lots of drips and things, you're going to have to sand all those drips. And unfortunately, wood is soft and epoxy is hard. So if you're sanding like this, you're just going to like take off all the wood around the drip and maybe take a little bit more off the little bit off the epoxy. So just be cautious with that. Uh, cabinet scrapers work really well if you're a woodworker. Um, Pre-coat wood with raw epoxy. Uh, you never just put additives or epoxy that has additives on it to the wood because it doesn't doesn't sink well into the wood. So you want the wood to absorb as much as you can. So you pre-coat it. Um, you can use a heat gun to seed, heat up the epoxy if it's really really messy, and then you can scrape it with a like a like a paint scraper. Uh, oh, for the reason the same heat reason the heat heat with a heat gun later on it makes the epoxy much softer, and so don't paint epoxy black because it'll absorb all the sunlight, and then it'll, it'll soften itself up. What's the last one? Oh, wear a respirator when sanding. Don't forget that part. OK, chapter three, sailing. This is sailing for engineers. Um, safety first. Um, so this was, this was a, a summer camp that some of the scamp nerds put on. And uh, this guy here is John Wellsford, the designer of the boat. And this guy here is my friend Howard. And I'll, I'll, if I have enough time, we'll talk a little bit about Howard here. Um, I'm going to try to wrap it up. Um, this is capsize testing, right? So know how when your boat goes over that you can get back into it. And in this case, it's pretty easy. You've got a centerboard on the other side. So you swim around. You grab the centerboard. You drag it down. It'll pop, the boat will pop right back up. And then what you have to do is get, yourself, get your body back into it. It's got fairly tall sides. So there's a lot of, lot of ways to do that. But uh, essentially, I've got a rope along the side that I can just put my feet on, sort of spread my legs a little bit, and then drop my, drop my body over the, over the, the, the gunnels. Um, so safety first. And that's it. <laughs> that's all. Right, right, um, safety first on this one. There's, there's a lot of other sailing tips, but that's not really where we're going to go with this, this one. Um, so this is, I, I, don't, I didn't really do anything, but if you go down to the maker stage, uh, I've got a boat build going in progress down there. This was the four foot sheet, four by eight sheet of plywood that I cut this from, and you can sort of picture how there's one piece, one piece, one piece, one piece, one piece, and then two half pieces. You put them all together. I did the, all that part at home. I cut all those parts because I knew I wasn't going to have power tools here, and I have power tools at home. So, uh, so I cut all those pieces out. And then and brought them here just like that. The only thing I had done previous to this was uh, gluing these together because I just didn't want to do that in the field. I just did it at home. Um, OK. It, yeah, it looks like we do have some time. So that, that friend of mine, Howard. So Howard was there. Uh, John Wellsford, the designer of the boat, flew up for this camp, as well as this guy named Howard Rice that I had never heard of. Howard, in 1989, there's Howard right there on the left. Uh, John Wellsford is the designer of the guy on the right. In 1989, Howard Rice got in a 17-foot, he calls it a sailing canoe. We would probably call it a kayak here in the Pacific Northwest. It's, it's, it has a little bit more open cut, which makes it technically a canoe, but whatever. Um, he got in that sailing canoe, and he went around uh, Tierra del Fuego, right, South America. Uh, I've got a picture. Yeah, so he was sailing. So you're kind of familiar with this, right? Here's the Strait of Magellan where all the ships go through. Um, and then they come back out this way and they go up that way to get to here, unless they're going through the Panama Canal. So Howard did something that very, very few humans on this planet have done. He went down into this, uh, into this national park down here. 
which there's a lot of shaking of heads, this is like incredibly dangerous, right? This is uh, Tierra del Fuego, land of fire. It's, it's windstorms galore. Um, and all these little, actually, let me zoom in one here. Oops, there. So here, to give you perspective, uh, Punta Arenas was the town that he, he came out of for this latest venture. I don't know about his earlier one. And so I'm going to zoom into about this area right here. So what Howard did was Howard was about 40 days out, 45 days out. And he was somewhere down, I've never been quite clear, but he was in one of these little bays down here south of Isla Dawson. He was down in one of these little bays, and he got caught for three days in 80 to 90 mile per hour willy was. And a willy was, you, you can see how they have got the little teeny bays there. You can think of it like fjords, right? They're very tall, but then the, the wind comes whipping down. And Howard got caught in those for three days before he could finally get himself out. And, uh, and the boat actually capsized. And so Howard had to self-rescue himself. He got himself washed up on shore. His boat was over on the side. And luckily there were some fishermen nearby that he was able to get to with the radio and they came and picked him up. Um, he easily could have died. Um, he's an amazing in individual. But I guess I started this story by saying 1989, he sailed amongst all this stuff down here, and he did it for about three months, um, living on his own. As a matter of fact, he said one of his goals of this latest trip was to go back because he had buried some, some food or some supplies on one particular island that he's dead certain are still there because, because nobody ever goes out to this area because it kills you, right? So nobody ever goes there. Um, so the interesting thing about this whole story is not, not my friend Howard, the well, actually, he's kind of an interesting guy, but the fact that he took the exact same boat that I have out here and modified it slightly. What you'll notice is he put, this isn't, this isn't the Bermuda rig that I talked about earlier. It's called a gaff rig, but it doesn't matter. Um, he's got a jib on here and a gaff rig, and then this is called a yawl back here. Um, and he chose that particular layout, but other than that, the boat is pretty much exactly the same as mine, although he didn't have a motor. He had oars. That's all he had was oars and sail. And he spent, well, his plan was to spend up to 90 days down there in, around the same area. So I, I think where, where I want to leave with that, and, and this is pretty much the end of the deck, and I'm happy to take questions, but uh, kind of where I want to leave with that is a good design. Um, John Wellsford has even said that of all his designs of all his boats, the scamp design is the, the, what he feels is the best for the purpose that it was designed for. Now, his design was not to go sail around Tierra del Fuego, but nonetheless, he feels like it's a very good design boat for a 12-foot boat, which is what Howard liked about it. Um, and so I, I think that's, as, a, as an engineer, as a, as a software dude and things like that, I, I like to think about good, solid, time-tested designs. And this is not a boat that you would look at and say, yeah, that's a solid, time-tested design. It doesn't look like a lot of other boats. She's kind of portly. Um, you know, it's kind of beany. It's a small, thin little boat. It's not something you're going to spend four nights on. Um, <laughs> oops. Um, <laughs> So, so, yeah, it's just the design is, if it's effective, then it's effective. It may not be what you expect, but it's an effective design and it works. And I really do enjoy sailing my little boat. Um, yeah. Um, oh, there's a picture of Howard in his boat. He named it the Southern Cross. Um, you can tell he's, he, he's a big fan of organization. He would, he would make a good software engineer. He, he puts everything in its bin where it belongs. He, he knows that when he writes malloc, he has to check, he has to write free somewhere else. Um, and he, you know, he's got everything well designed out. These are his uh, self-rescue slings right here along the side. So if he goes overboard, he grabs one of those, does the same thing where he blops himself over. Um, yeah, he had, he had to build a couple extra things. He had to build this, this, these spars out here on the, on the bow and on the stern for his, for his particular sailing rig. Um, and so that's my friend Howard. He, he is alive. He did, he did make it back. Um, I saw him, when did I see him? I saw him in September last year. Yeah, so, um, and I haven't seen him since, but he's an interesting guy. Okay, so that's the end of my slide deck. Uh, I, I, when I was building the boat, I have a, a blog. Uh, these guys have building supplies. This is the small craft advisor where, where I have my, where I have the community of scamp players. Uh, Gig Harbor Boats, if you're interested not in building a boat, but having the same boat, uh, Gig Harbor Boats makes a, makes a fiberglass one. And then Howard's blog is down there, and I don't think he's updated his blog in a while. But, 
that's what I have. I'd love to take any questions or uh, play, play, my, play my slide deck. I've, I, I did have a whole bunch of pictures in here because I didn't know how good the internet was going to be. So, Any questions? No, the center board is not asymmetrical in any way. It is, it is, uh, there's a, there's a design, again, I, like the BS 1088 thing. There's a, an organization called NACA, and I, don't, I can't tell you what it stands for, but they're the guys who essentially bless every sort of foil design because essentially that's what it is. It's a foil. As it moves through the water, it has lift properties like a, like an airfoil. Um, and so I do know that it's measured out to NACA, some sort of NACA curve that's well approved, uh, but it's, it's totally symmetric on both sides. As a matter of fact, that's kind of interesting. You saw the picture of, the, of two halves being glued together. As far as I can tell, those were two completely, I mean, they just took the same, same piece and made two of them on the CNC mill. Um, that, by the way, was a lot more than nine millimeter plywood. That was... I, I don't think you're going to be able to get a view of it from here. Yeah, I, you can see the ply. There's a ply there, a ply there, a ply there, a ply there, a ply there. So it's, it's, it's very smooth like that. When I got it, um, CNCs are, are good at a lot of things, but like making totally angled things, at least the ones that they had. So it was kind of rough. I just sanded it down a little bit. Um, the rudder was the same way. I didn't put any pictures in here, but the rudder is exactly the same way. By the way, I had to cut that 24-pound piece of lead into two pieces, and the guys at the lead shop were like, yeah, just use your jigsaw, and then wash your hands afterwards. I'm like, but I can't buy a house without licking the walls or you know, with worrying about lead-based paint, and you're just telling me that I can, I can just cut it with my jigsaw and then wash my hands? I, I, I still don't really get that, but... Um, but yeah, no, the, the foils are same way one side or the other. As far as I can tell, it makes no difference to the sailing of it. Any other? How long did the project take and what's the total cost? Um, so the, the course to, to, with Howard and, and, uh, and John Wellsford was about two grand, I think, for me to stay in Port Townsend or, and to take that course. Um, the kit itself cut from plywood was 2,200 bucks. Um, and that's actually not that expensive because those sheets of BS 1088 plywood or a four by eight sheet at six mil is last time I looked about 80 to 100 bucks. So there's 12 of them there, right? Now, granted, they're probably getting a little bit better discount at the CNC mill. Um, so I, I didn't feel like that was a bad cost. And then uh, my time, I never added it up fully, but I know that I have more than a thousand hours of, of building on it. I sort of get manic on things like that. So. Uh, like the last speaker here, right? You, you're, you're thinking about, you had to step away from it the night before, and so you're going to go back the next day, and I had a plan for everything I wanted to get done. It often went wrong, but at least I, you know, did something. I pretty much did something most nights and most weekends for a whole year um, to put it together. So a 1,000 hours in a year, yeah. yeah. So if you ever have a 1,000 spare hours on your hands, yeah, build a boat, what the hell? Yeah. <laughs> Nothing else? Oh, one more. A couple. Uh, what, was, what I did specifically was I came in here, dropped off some of my boat building supplies, and then drove down to Lieberhaven. And it's about a two and a half mile sail up here. So uh, unfortunately, um, I can only get to my boat when it's, when it's low tide right now, unless I feel like getting wet. And getting wet at 10 o'clock before I go to bed or 11 or midnight or whatever not really very appealing to me. So I'm actually going to go out there tonight and sail back down tomorrow morning. And then I can, then I can be here because I haven't been able to party any night that I've been here. <laughs> so I got to fix that problem. Yeah. Yep. So I'll do that tomorrow. I, that was, the plan was to do that on Sunday, but that whole getting wet thing every evening is really not, not my bag. Is there something else? Yes. I, I, I'm not familiar with the monocoque process. I, I know that you're using, you're using the structure of the materials to, to structure other materials around them, and I, I, can't, I can't really give any insight into that. I, it it kind of does in a way. Um, a lot of that structure was in the egg shelling, 
But then it's interesting because the planks that stretched along each side, they really only had, I said there were eight bulkheads, they really only had eight attachment points at each one of those. And so you just put, and they didn't, we didn't even make a big fillet on those or anything. You just sort of put them on there, attach them on there. Um, this was interesting. Um, when you attach them to that six millimeter plywood uh, for the, the, the bulkheads, um, there's some new plastic nails on the market. You can either use a, uh, a stainless steel nail, which will never rust, right? Or you can use a plastic, but if, however, you hit a stainless steel nail with your plane, you have to go back and, and redo everything, or trying to sand a stainless steel nail is kind of ridiculous. Um, so the new plastic nails. I did not use any of those plastic nails, but I'm very interested in trying some of those for various applications. Um, so I, I can't really compare monocoque construction to this, but I, I have a feeling there's some similarities. Yeah. All right. Thank you.